आ रही had this written for uh had this written for last week but we're just going to go ahead and start it here you've seen this slide before but uh in a different context um, I'll update. this is sort of the beginning of what we talked about last time um we were talking about albedos and emissivity and what i mean by that is Albedo is how reflective something is, right? So we say something is light uh, or white in that it reflects all light. And you would say something is dark in that it absorbs all light. But of course, that's not really the whole story because we have objects that can be reflective or, uh, sorry, we can, we can be, we can have objects that are fully transparent at one wavelength and fully opaque at another. What was the examples that we had of that? Glass. glass, right? So I can see through glass. I can see through glass, but uh, infrared, right? And so this is the idea of emissivity, right? This is different from the output. And uh, we're going to look at some of the sublimation temperatures because when we begin to discuss the idea of how to build planets, it's really um, uh, a huge factor to consider how warm was the disk. Because if the disk from which you form material is too hot, then maybe you can only condense rocks. But if it's cold enough, you might be able to condense water. And if it's even colder, then you can condense methane, right? What that means is that you have ices which are heavier than just 
the metal, the metal mine. Okay? There might be more available ices that you can turn into your tank. Okay. We talked about that a little bit a week ago, um, last Thursday, but this is sort of where we ended up, right? We had this black body function. Did you find the lecture on YouTube? The one of four. <laughs> What'd you think? I don't know. Oh my God. <laughs> Strangle everyone. It's okay. I, I definitely didn't put any time into that, you know? Doesn't make me cry at night. Okay. Um, so what's a black body? Um, yeah, vertical radiation and great like, uh, thermal equilibrium. Yeah, so a couple things that we want is we want thermal equilibrium. Um, so that just means So this thing is in thermal equilibrium with its surroundings, so its temperature is not going up or going down. And because its temperature is not going up or going down, then if it's a perfect absorber, it must be a perfect <laughs> emitter, right? So for example, you might have a sphere, okay? And uh, all of the energy in is equal to the energy out. And that way the surface stays at a beautiful temperature. Team. And that's the idea of trying to connect light to statistical mechanics or to thermal physics. Right. Okay. Um, just to summarize what happens. Okay. Here is wavelength, and here is intensity. And uh, I'm not going to read you the entire lecture, but I'm just going to give you the highlights because you need to understand this. Empirical evidence inside of a laboratory shows that there is a proportionality. Okay, it starts down here and it heads up like that. So the year is the 1890s and folks are in the laboratory and they're finding that as you increase the frequency of light, you get more energy. Right? And they say, uh-oh, uh that is going to lead to a disaster. Because if you go out towards the ultraviolet, this should give you the result that you would have infinite energy. As nu goes to infinity, you would get infinite energy. And that doesn't make any sense. Not logical. Okay? So Einstein comes along. What is Einstein's first Nobel for? No one was for general relativity. Yes, in fact, no one has received a uh, a. Uh... Actually, I don't know if that's true. Maybe someone did. There might be a, there might be a um, in the early two thousands Nobel for uh, dark energy, but uh, yeah, no, uh, I didn't receive one for that. He only received one Nobel Prize. What are his three great achievements? General Well then, yes, E equals MC squared. Not for that. It wasn't for general. GR, not for that. It's the one that no one remembers. It is the reason why we have quantum mechanics. Okay, it is the photoelectric effect. Okay. So this was and is probably the most important thing that happens in your daily life. The photoelectric effect is responsible for every piece modern electronics okay transistor radios probably didn't need it but moving to semiconductors you certainly need it right you would have had radio no big deal radio makes sense 
but to have digital information, you need the photoelectric effect. You need to understand how electrons and photons represent similar things in that they represent individual objects. Because before then, light was a wave, not a particle. This is the recognition that light is a particle, which is a very stupid thing about it. Light is definitely a wave, but it's a wave particle. And it's just not stuff that we can understand. Okay, so this here, the photoelectric effect, when you apply it, tells you that actually this thing turns over, and this is the Planck function. Okay, so watch the YouTube video. <laughs> Not to watch any YouTube, but to go on that. And if you hate that lecture, um, one of the cool properties that you have here is that this is the behavior of the um, of the energy. So this is like an energy density, and it's an ener den energy density um, as a function of wavelength. And so you can see here as the wavelengths get really small. If you don't have this term, you just have this, then one over a small number gets really big and everyone's spot, right? But this really helps out because this exponential here looks like, well, let's see, this gets really small. This number over a small number is really big. Exponential of a big number is exponential of a big number is a big number and one over a big number is a small number okay i almost got scared there so big number times a big or sorry big number times a small number can still be a number and that's the important part is that we needed a way to define energy density as a function of wavelength such that it was still a number and that's what this piece does so if you're taking statistical physics or statistical mechanics, you know about the equal partition of states, right? So the idea that if you're in thermal equilibrium, then you're gonna put energy into these different states. And so you have to categorize and count up those states. That's all they did. They just counted up all the states that an electron, or sorry, that a photon could be in. And that's what you end up with. And I can show you how that happens in that unit. And then you get some fun little uh, 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 constants. So here's your H, this is the Planck constant. That's that guy. This is K, this is your Boltzmann constant. And this is your Stefan Boltzmann constant, where F is the sigma T to the fourth. Okay. And of course, one of the fun properties here is that for a given object with certain size, you increase the temperature, the thing that it does is that it moves the peak temperature to the left. And importantly, it is now producing more light at all wavelengths. So this is what we call the Planck function, right? And it's going to radiate at all of these things. So everything we do after this will be a modification. So for example, if I put a hot gas in front of it, Right, I'm gonna pull lines out, absorb lines out of it, and it's gonna decrease the amount in certain locations. Okay, this is the ideal version, and we're gonna move towards reality. Okay. Um, yeah, that's what I said. This happens rarely. <laughs> um, bodies that absorb the same way at all wavelengths are practically non-existent. So generally speaking, we have an emissivity function here. And that's this little eta or little epsilon here. I don't know what you want to call that. Um, and it's going to be a function of wavelength. Okay. So what that means is that it's always less than one. Okay. So it can be equal to one. That is to say, there is no, um, um, there is nothing taking away the radiation there, but it always is between zero and one. So the idea of our albedo, which is how much are we reflecting, this is going to be similar for emissivity. 
which is going to be the um, uh, how do I say this properly? I don't want to say it requests. The emissivity is just uh, how much of the light is getting through. And we have some other fun terms that we can add in here. Okay. If the emissivity is the same at all of the wavelengths, then the object is called a gray box. <laughs> so let me just explain what that means really quick. Black body would be that all the light comes in and all of that light goes out. So if instead, this is a very silly idea, okay? Light comes in, but only half goes out, such that the emissivity is a half, it's a gray body. Or the vice versa, right? This goes in, the two comes out. In practice, you'll never hear that one. I mean, you will because we work for a strong but you won't hear it from me. That's the rest of this lecture. Okay. Um, so we can we can say, you know, you know, if you think of the sharp spectral features due to the individual lines and molecules, right? Over a certain wavelength region, that smooths out. So you could say, you know, let's take some part of the spectrum and let's imagine, and I'm going to draw this spectrum from memory because that's how good I am. And so here's the sun spectrum. Okay? It does this, and then it goes up like this, and then it has one tip like this, and then one dip, and then it goes like that. Okay. So this is in the mid ultraviolet. Okay. This feature right here is neutral magnesium. This feature right here is ionized magnesium. Okay. And oh, other way around, sorry. Okay. And there's all these other features in here that have to do with um, particles, ions, and molecules that exist only in the, the surface or the, the atmosphere that's on the surface of the sun. Right. So there really is neutral and ionized magnesium in the atmosphere of the sun, and so those appear as dips. They're absorbing from what should be just a smooth curve. And so you can imagine this is perhaps what the curve would look like without any features. And so anywhere that there's an excess, this can be attributed to some absorption, and anywhere there is addition, that can be attributed to emission. Right? Okay. So this goes from about 210 nanometers out to about 310 nanometers. Oops, not meters, but nanometers. And all I'm trying to say here is that if we cared about the specific atom, then it makes a lot of sense to use the specific emission at that atom. But if you're just curious how much ultraviolet light is going to make it to your object, then perhaps the easiest thing to do here is to take both of these and take an average. Right? And that average, right, is, you know, it's not great. It misses all of the features in there. But it helps it helps you to represent how gray the object is. Does that kind of make sense? So if you just imagine what the perfect black body might look like, and you compare that to all the dips and wiggles, then you're going to have it be a little bit below whatever the perfect average is, right? That idea makes sense? Um, we're going to define uh, the albedo, which is related to the emissivity, and that is going to be one minus emissivity. So the albedo is like the reflectivity. Okay. So let's do an example. Let's use our brain holes. 
What is the temperature of a spherical body with mass m and radius r at a distance little r from the sun with an albedo and an emissivity? Okay. Heated by sunlight and radioactivity and cooled by its own thermal emission. And what I want here is the temperature. Okay, rather than each of us work on this on our own, I want you to shout out ideas and I'm going to do it on the board. In a Start the starting starts. What do we want? See. Okay. What do we have? Albedo. Mass. Mass. Radius. Distance. Emissive. Anything else? Do we have heat? Oh, okay, the sun's in my office, right? That's a constant. And yeah, I could give myself this, right? So we can look that up. That's the uh, radiation from the interior and the function of whatever the composition is. Okay. So I have all of these items. Do I have P in? Is it calculable? Do I have P out? No. no. Why? Oh. Well, that's fine. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, we're trying to find temperature. We don't have temperature. We're trying to find temperature. So this requires T. Are we fucked? Not necessarily because it'd be a very bad class. That was the end of class. Go home now. Okay, so what do we do? So let's let's you know this is thinking about the letters. Let's go back and ask ourselves the question. In words, what does P in mean? Uh more words. Like a, like you're explaining it to your, your cousin at a bar. Okay, so like stuff from sun plus stuff from sun, oh, right? What's that equal? I guess the first question is, how do we relate those two power states? What? just about great body or something. Uh, there might be double the power in or double the power out. Good, right. So there might be double the power in or double the power out. That's certainly true, right? So in that circumstance, we think about this region, right? 
right? So the albedo is one minus the emissivity. So they are related. And down here, I have something like the emissivity of the planet is shown here. And the albedo is shown here. Right. So this is already accounting for the fact that this body is in fact gray. Why do you need to solve for the emissivity? What am I giving it to you? So you can then apply it. So solve, solving the equation, but all everything else on the side of it. Oh, wait, it was already given. And we have A. These are just numbers. All right, let me ask you another question. Is this body in thermodynamic equilibrium? Why? Yeah, so you're saying like this is a bigger part than this. Right. So that would be an interpretation. That would be a completely valid interpretation, except for we get to make that decision. Right. So for example, here I said, what's the temperature of a triple black body? If I'm asking you this question, what the temperature is, unless I'm specifying it otherwise, I'm asking for it to be in front of Okay, so what that says is this is heated by sunlight and radioactivity here and cooled by its own thermal emission. And I'm asking you to give me the temperature if it were in thermal equilibrium. So if it were in thermal equilibrium, what would I say about those two P? Ah, right. So then I could say this, right? P out over here. What would I put here in, in words? In words, there's stuff that it makes, right? I'm just trying to break it down so that it kind of like makes sense uh, in sort of the, the simplest of terms in class. So if we see something more complicated, we still know our point. Okay, so P in has to equal P out if, as Zori points out, if in thermal equilibrium. Okay. So if we accept that as true, then we can find temperature. If we don't accept that as true, then temperature is not well defined, right? Especially in the way that we're talking about it here. Because this piece requires thermal equilibrium. Now, one thing that you may find if you want to get more complicated with this is that you can approximate thermal equilibrium over short time periods. So let's say you're watching, you know, let's say this thing is changing as a function of time early on in the solar system, and it's cooling down, and it's cooling down, and it's cooling down. You can approximate the temperature as small time steps in which this was constant, right? Do this for a million years at a time, and then do it for 10 billion years. But I'm thinking like, could you turn that into a conversion? Exactly, yeah, yeah. But but at each step, this may or may not be true. Right? So it's not true over the maybe the thermal equilibrium may not be true over the entire period. But as long as you're looking at it on a state by state basis, then you can take it. Okay. So now what I do in order to find T. You have to say well it's equation. Yeah, so set both equations equal to each other, and then what? Nine. Okay. So the math is not complicated. It's just you got to know where to start, right? 
That's something started now. Oh, fuck. Went too far. Oh, good. All right, there we go. The only thing you didn't have was this, right? So this is the only place that it matters, right? Because this is a function of, if you look up here, have this uh, epsilon sigma four pi r squared. That's like a flux characteristic. That's how much physical size and heat you're getting, right? So you put that on the bottom here, and this term, of course, is a relationship that changes or that compares on the top how much stuff is being uh, produced inside, and you're comparing it to how well it's being radiated. And this is how much stuff you're getting from the sun compared to how well you're radiating. <laughs> and interestingly enough, these bars cancel, so this is just about how far away you go. And that tells you the temperature of the surface. Now, if it's small, if most of your heat doesn't come from that, then you can just throw away that term entirely. And you get something like this. And we can make our lives even simpler by defining temperature of a black body. You can be, if none of this was here, just that stuff pulled out. Then you just have the temperature of some body with. Emissivity and, and albedo as defined is your black body temperature times small thing. Uh, question. This is just a brain question. Uh, emissivities and albedos greater than or equal to one. Greater than or equal to one? yeah. What's the relationship between albedo and emissivity again? We can move that to the other side. So if the albedo is 0.7, let's take or take Venus 0.6. Um, what's the emissivity? Okay, so what's that factor in front? Yeah, that's kind of strange, right? That's one. So why would we even write it that way? Well, let's go back to stuff. Here, we want to note that we're saying the infrared emissivity is a, whereas the albedo is a. And remember that these are both wavelength dependent. So while this emissivity here is, sorry, while this albedo here is for visible, right? This would be the, the emissivity in the visible, right? But I'll guess you, we've never even discussed the emissivity of Venus in the infrared. But it can't possibly hold, right? It's likely low. Why is it lower? Because it's got all these atmospheric clouds that are trapping and being able to disperse that heat by some of the seven center of the surface. So it's really important to remember that A and E, written this way, is only true at the wavelength you're talking about. Right? 
So if on the left hand side I'm talking about visible, I can't use this for the ultraviolet. And similarly, I'm talking about the infrared albedo. I can't use this for the visible piece of it. I have to look at those numbers. Simple? Yeah. Yeah. So now this makes sense. It'd be kind of stupid to just have one, but we don't. So there's Venus. Uh, 0. 0.7. And in fact, it isn't 0. 0.4. <laughs> it's one. <laughs> Good. So here is the luminosity. Uh, that, that piece right there is 0. 0.74. Okay. And uh, we're neglecting radiative heating, so don't think about the facts that you have about the thinking of the surface. Uh, and Earth is 0.89. Okay, notice that these are all less than one. Mars is great, you know, it uh, got 0.96, it's pretty close to a perfect black body. Worst black body here, surprisingly, Venus. Okay. So um, at Earth, we should have the expectation of having 278 degrees Kelvin, uh, given the two contributions, that is light from the sun and heat from the interior. Um, but with the combination of our albedo and our emissivity, we actually get about 248. And of course, that is not good for life. Right? What temperature is that in normal sleep? Sub zero, right? Everywhere. Globally, sub zero by a lot. And so, of course, this is not the temperature that it is today because we are ignoring. Okay, so um, where does the surface temperature equal the freezing point of water as a function of albedo? I don't know if we asked that question before. That's a funny way to have written that. Uh, <laughs> Let's let's think about this in the context of um, forming the solar system, and this is the orbital radius here. So uh, this is distance away from the sun. This is very close to the sun, very far from the sun, and what you're seeing here is the temperature. The reason that it's a straight line because there's a log log graph, right? So what I want to show you here is that the black body kind of hidden, um, but you have all of these different forms of albedo. And what I'm looking for is this location where water ice begins to sublimate, and of course, by extension, to condense. So we're going to use that same formula that we just had. The only thing that we're going to change is the orbital distance, right? This piece right here. Yeah, okay. And when we look at all of the different types of asteroids, we haven't talked about the exact types yet. We'll come back to this a little bit later. Um, they, they have different albedos. When we talk about their contributions to water, how water rich they are, you'll see that there is a correlation between the type of asteroid and their water. That's the ice line that exists in the asteroid belt. So somewhere in here, if you have a, remember we, we showed those groups of asteroids and there were some that have basically not moved. They were like on the bottom. I don't know if you remember this plot. Um, plot. They look like some major axis like this. And there are these resonance locations. And then we had a group of asteroids like that, and then nothing in here, lots of stuff, nothing, and then lots of stuff, and then nothing, right? Like that. And then there were these populations down here. You remember those little ones at the bottom? 
This is pretty good. This is pretty good. Considering it's true. Okay. Oh, uh, and then you have some fun. That's all the asterisk. And these two here, they sit basically undisturbed in the asteroid belt. And they live to straddle the ice. Line. So stuff that is over here is likely, and this is something we interact with, this is A, and this is the information. Um, um, and these objects here, they live on the side of the ice line where they are allowed to have form more ice line. The asteroid belt marks that transition. Um, the ice content of the outermost asteroids, the ski class, should be larger than the innermost. Go back for one second. The um, 0 0.05, the albedo, kind of surprising. I don't want you to think that just because there's water in there, that these are snowballs. Right, <laughs> they're dirt, <laughs> they're very dirty, but they have water. Here. Um, everything solid is further out than the asteroid has a lot of ice, and I know that the next object that you see is, of course, Jupiter, and it doesn't appear to have any ice. That's also because of the fact that if you grab gas from the disk. So the first moon that you find is something like Io or Europa. Io probably has gotten rid of a full moon of ice, whereas Europa has probably more water than any other moon. So the availability of ice formed into a planet or planetesimal is moderated by the presence of this ice. Um, oh, the first C-class series, the so C-class is the outermost asteroid, you know, series, right? Series is the largest asteroid, dwarf body. Uh, bulk density, 2.1 grams. That's pretty good. It's not quite water, but it's definitely not as bad as the three to six grams of terrestrial planets, right? That's like an icy water mixture. Okay. Okay, let's learn some other stuff. This stuff will be in mind. I think it's in So we just talked about albedo. Let's make it harder. Um, <laughs> the geometric albedo is the ratio of the flux reflected head on to that of the incident. Thanks, that's what I just said. No. Big it. Thank you for being honest. Let's draw it. The geometric albedo is different than the albedo. So the albedo assumes, okay, uh, light is simply incident, um, uh, you know, on an object. And then, like, you know, let's do a perfect example. You have your paper. All right. Okay, light bounces off this, and then some fractions can bounce. Okay, that is the simplest idea of a. Okay, so now what happens when I do this? Now it goes everywhere, right? And I'm not going to do this to your paper, but if I started to crumple it, right, then you would see that light may bounce in and bounce around before it bounces out. Okay. So we can define a couple different versions of the albedo. So one, the geometric albedo is the ratio of the flux reflected head on to the incident. So if I'm the sun and I look at the crumpled Dante paper, how much of the crum crumpled Dante paper goes back to me, the sun? That's the geometric albedo. Compared to the bond albedo, the ratio of the total flux reflected and scattered in all directions. So the one that we think of, the one that you just learned, right? The one in your mind, that's the bond element. The geometric albedo is going to be greater or smaller than the bond albedo. 
it has to be small, right? Because bond accounts for everything. All right. Let's say a couple more things. Well, these surfaces, not surprisingly, tend to reflect light back the way it came. The moon and Mercury, for example, are more than 10 times brighter and full than a Makes sense why I just said that? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Let's do the jump. The moon is easier to do the jump. Okay. Here's the sun. Here's the earth. Here's the moon. Okay. I'm drawing the moon half a limit. If the moon were perfectly spherical and radiated light equally in all directions, or sorry, scattered light equally in all directions, how much brightness should you expect to get from the moon here? Half, right? That's smart. That's the way you should think about it. Compared to here, right? You would expect this would be one. But if what I said is true, if bumpy surfaces tend to reflect light back the way it came, as opposed to preferentially scattering in all directions, the difference between the bond albedo and the geometric albedo, so if the geometric albedo is bigger, right, for rougher objects, then in this position, more of the light would be scattered this way. So you would receive less than half. In fact, this number becomes what? That's what I'm saying, right? Which is kind of surprising, right? Okay. Another way of writing this. You have the brightness of mercury here as a function of phase angle, and the phase angle is um, shown like this. So if I'm seeing it face on versus from the edge, well, of course, I can see it all the way around. That's the phase angle is here. And this is the brightness of mercury. Um, it's shown on a log scale. So uh, <laughs> negative numbers are brighter. So not really fair. It's like <laughs> the brightness out here. Uh, you know, it's 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 just a small fraction of the surface showing and even that back scattering. But what you notice here is that this really really falls off, even towards night. So now you would be if I were to go in there and laugh. Right. So I want you to imagine that that what's in is this really really perfect. Okay. So in the magnitude system. Um, it's just like the decibel system. Every number is an order of magnitude smaller. Or sorry, two point two times smaller. So here we have something like two and a half. That's two and a half or two point two five to the power of two and a half. Two point two five to the power of two. That's big, right? So that means that it's about 7.6 times brighter when I'm facing Mercury face on than when I'm facing it from the side. And this is experiment, it's not This is observational data, so. Okay. Um, now, uh, it's important to remember that that was for visible light. You know, all of the conversations we're gonna have um, the wavelength dependent. So, for example, if I say something like this, bumpy surfaces tend to reflect the light the back, back the way it came. That might be the case for visible light, but it might not be the case 
or radio. Right? Radio is really good at showing us where things are um, rough versus smooth because of how well smooth areas reflect it back to us, where it's bumpy and it's just dispersing. Right? Oh, no. All right. Um, here's a here's a lot of numbers. If you want to go to sleep later, you just go ahead and look at these. So here's your mercury, our geometric albedo, and our bond albedo. Okay, let's see if we can scan these. Okay. Albedo varies with wavelengths. Um, we're going to be talking about the monochromatic albedo, that is the ratio of the reflected and the scattered, and then you get the average, right? Um, the bond albedo is the one we use in solar heating calculations. Uh, it's the hardest one to measure. Don't worry about that. So you're going to use measurements of it. You'll notice there aren't measurements of it for many of, for many of these moons, uh, as opposed to these other ones here. Let's go back a second. Let's make sure we understand uh, that we have the total flux reflected and scattered, right, in all directions to the incident. And we're going to compare that to the reflected coordinates. So here's your geometric albedo, how much is reflected towards the sun. And here's your bond albedo. Does that surprise them that they would be so close? Yeah, let's work through this. So we made a statement about visible light, and we said most of the visible light for a rough surface is reflected where? Right back at the sun, right back at the object, right? Okay, so that, that is like most of your albedo. So then all you have to account for is 1.3% that is scattered in another direction. And that's kind of remarkable, in my opinion, right? Uh, because that's not a lot, right? Okay. You can look at the moon too. Uh, moon's right here. There's the geometric albedo. And now we're backwards. Okay. So you can already see that using the idea of geometric albedo and bond albedo, they're not super easy. Right? Because the way that we hold in our mind the idea of the bond albedo versus geometric albedo, uh, they're not always going to behave in the way we want them to. Here's the Earth versus the Earth's bond albedo. So they need to be scattered. So the Earth has an atmosphere. Bond albedo is different. Venus has an atmosphere too. Okay. Okay. Generally speaking, I'm showing you this just so that you have numbers. All right. Okay. Oops. So let's talk more about how we eat something. And to do that, we're really going to think about the process of light. Okay. So we've assumed uniform surface temperature, and that's probably not right. If you have a sphere, you are not going to heat the sphere up the same way at all points. And in fact, we know this because we are currently going through temperature change. Okay. Why is the Earth going to temperature changes? But that's that's a so thing. And so folks at the poles don't get as warm as folks at the equator. That's just known. Right? So let's figure out why that is. Why is it that sunlight gets absorbed differently at different parts of the curve? Okay. So we said that. And we have this idea here that we need to create some geometry for plane parallel waves. Okay, let's imagine lights coming in on the left-hand side, 
And we're going to start with something that is perpendicular, and we're going to shift it, okay, so that we are absorbing a different amount. So we can talk about all of these parts here. Uh, let's say we want to describe the geometry. It's all it's all discussed here, but but the basic idea is that um, there's going to be some variation along the curvature of the body with latitude. So if, for example, I draw, I draw a sphere like this, light's coming in, and here I'm absorbing looks a lot of light. Over here, right, I may be absorbing only like one piece of light, but I still get to radiate as much as I want. There's no restrictions on radiation. Right? I might be more effective at radiating at poles. Whereas here, maybe I have light coming in and have light coming out at an equal amount. And this will give us full um, Slowly rotating bodies get much warmer on the Sullivan side. That's surprising. <laughs> and of course, you know, there's some thermal inertia. What that means is that, you know, it takes a little bit of time for heat to propagate. So what we'll find on something like the lunar surface is that heat will propagate inwards. And then as that goes over onto the night side, that heat then needs to propagate back out in order to radiate out in space. So there's what the numbers look like. If you're spinning very quickly, those tend to average out. Whereas if they do not spin very quickly, then you have large day and night cycles. So there's going to be variation with temperature, with angle between the vertical. So. Okay. Let's set up the math for this. Oh no, not math. Um, suppose you have a planet in the atmosphere. Still have no atmosphere in any of it. It's in circular orbit, one AU from a star, just like the sun. It has uniform albedo, okay? Some albedo of A. I don't care what it is. It rotates with a period equal to its orbital period. So it always shows the same face for the sun. Does that make sense? Okay. Neglecting the conduction of heat, what is the distribution of temperature? So assume there's no ability to transport heat except through absorption and re-radiation. Okay. What is the distribution of temperature on the sunlit side? High here. Lower here. Right. Now, can you do it? And you write T as a function of theta. That would be preferred. Work on this as a team. Okay, you have the angle. Good. What is the angle tell you? So this is some distance r. We're going to keep the same everywhere. And uh, let's call this some location theta. This is a 3D body. I'm drawing it in 2D, but I don't know how to draw in 3D. 
So there is some location here, which makes nice little ribbon. It goes all the way around, right? And so this is coming out of the board and back around. And at that latitude, at that angle away from the center, it's going to be exactly the same temperature. So there's no rotation, right? So everything on that little strip has the same temperature. And we're going to use an infinitesimal strip, V theta. It's already telling us how we should do the problem, right? We have a little bit of light in here. We have an angled surface. What's the first piece we're doing? Yeah, so we want to understand something about R sine theta. R sine theta tells us what there? So R sine theta is this part here. What does that tell us about this here? Let's, let's go back a step and think about how we're going to do this. I want to know how the temperature varies from here to here. And I said that when they're here, right, I am absorbing less light. Sorry. When I'm here, I'm absorbing straight on. No big deal. When I go up, I'm absorbing less light than I could while still being able to radiate as much as I want, right? I expect the temperature to go down as a function of uh, that. Okay, so what I'm saying is I want some function that describes the surface in this little ring. And in order to do that, I need to be able to describe the geometry in this ring. How would I describe this little thin infinitesimal ring? Yeah, two questions in there somewhere. So let's start off with some ideas, okay? So I know it's a little ring. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give it a D, little. And what is the dimensions of our ring? Okay, that's not the dimensions, though. You're not wrong, but that's not the dimensions. That's not the dimension. What are the dimensions? Would be two versions of dimension. Dimension there would be length squared. Another version of dimension would be time. Right? I think that those are all definitions of dimension, right? So my question about this strip that goes around this 3D object, and I ask for what the dimensions are. Here's the 
Yeah, yeah, that's where we're going for sure. But in order to get there, you said circumference, that would be just one of these lines, not the strip. But the circumference, sure, plus a little bit, right? That's why we're using the d theta. I'm going to use a surface area, right? So it'll start with the circumference and then just a little smidge farther. Right, and that'll be the d theta part that we're thinking about. So how do we write this? Okay, let's write it and then we'll see. There are not a lot of time. Okay, so the first part here, this is the two pi r sine theta. And remember that r sine theta you had before, the one straight up, that's it, right? So this is the circumference Uh, at that point, plus a little bit, or times a little bit, I should say, times uh, r d theta. And r d theta, of course, that little strip. Okay, so in practice, that looks like 2 pi r squared sine theta theta. Okay. That is how wide this flat strip ribbon is all the way around. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the area, the projected area perpendicular to the direction of the sunlight that does not take into account the curvature, right? <laughs> well, that's great because all we have to do here is just draw out this geometry. Right. I don't have that strategy. Right, one But there is an angle there. <laughs> and we're going to show that those angles uh, can be found together. But here we have dx perpendicular at that point. And that's just dx, the one that we started with, multiplied by cosine theta. Right. So let's see if that works. Um, as I bring this angle down towards zero, okay, what is uh, cosine theta when theta is close to zero? Four. One. Okay, that works out really well because now as my ring gets closer to the center, it's almost exactly perpendicular. And as I head off towards the poles, it disappears, right? The perpendicular amount and the amount that I'm talking about here. Okay. So we could say that the power absorbed by this ribbon, remember we were talking about how much we get in, is just the flux from the sun. We're not going to add any radiative heating from the interior. The albedo times the, the size of the ring. Okay. And that's got a lot of numbers, but those are not going to scare us. <clears throat> okay. So let's compare that to the emission. Now the emission we saw before, right? We have this thermo thermodynamic equilibrium here. That's dp in and dp out. We say that we get these things in and we get out. So the only thing is, is that temperature at the surface at every location um, is going to get out to that same rate. And you can get out more at the top than it can get out here. It's getting less. So here I have the dp out is just the flux of the ribbon multiplied by yes. And that's this one here that we had before. You'll notice that my flux of the ribbon is um, 2 pi r squared as opposed to 4 pi r squared. So that shouldn't freak you out. That's because in the original statement, I said that we are not that in the whole sphere, it's getting half the sphere. And notice that we did it here too, right? Two pi plus two. Okay. Okay, so if it's in equilibrium, I can set both of those powers equal to each other. Oh my God, what a travesty, right? But it's okay. There's a lot of shared terms, right? The R's are going to disappear here. 
The signs are going to disappear here. Right? And what I really want is I want this TS. And that TS doesn't even depend on the TA. In fact, TS, I don't have to integrate at all. All of these pieces, they just come out here, such that T naught is the temperature right here. And then it decreases as it goes up. Okay. So let's see if we can do this for the sun. The sun, fuck. For the moon. <laughs> we definitely can't do it for the sun. <laughs> So let's uh let's see what this looks like. So using the parameters of the moon, we set the bond out here for the moon is 1 and the is 1. So this is what it should be at the subsolar point. Subsolar point is this point here. By definition, so it's pointing for the sun. And it says it should be hot. Ooh, smoking. 382 degrees Kelvin. Go look at the data. Okay, this is data from um, the name, the first name of the um, scientist is Jessica Sunshine, Dr. Jessica Sunshine, Moxie team. We look here, it's pretty hot, it's pretty sunny. That's not it. I calculated 380, that's not it. And notice what happens as we go off to the sides, it gets cooler, right? And you can't really see where the edge is. Is not a great job in data presentation. The reason I would not let you do this as a graduate student um, or as a student is because you can't tell where the image ends, right? So you should always create an image like this. You should show your user the physical bounds. Okay, but we can compare that here and we can say, okay, as I go from 382, which is the, this is, I just put this in the slide, so I'm this last session. And I go over to 300, you know, 300 is somewhere in between these two colors. That's down here. Okay, it kind of makes sense. It's about 50 degrees latitude, right? Now, is this super reasonable? No, it won't go to, Zero degrees Kelvin at the poles. There's, of course, one thing that we didn't do in this process, which was what major assumption did we make at the beginning when we had the spherical body and we were trying to compare heat absorbed versus heat uh, emitted? Heat's not allowed to move away. So I said the only way to get rid of heat was through emitting it. And the reality, of course, is that when this is hot, it warms the ground next to it, which warms the ground next to it. That's called thermal diffusivity. But in fact, heat can propagate through the surface to the poles so that it's not zero degrees Kelvin. Okay, you'll do this. But please understand it. And then watch the YouTube video that I Question, comments, concerns? 